Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Tuesday Night Live, brought to you by Crowcast. Of course, uh, another big week in uh, Adelaide Football Club world, uh, lots to talk about, and joining me as usual is Peter J. How are you going, Pete? Good, mate. How are you? Very well, thank you. Donkey, how are you? Yeah, good to be with you and your listeners tonight, Phoenix. And uh, <laughs> nice to have Macca again with us tonight uh, after last week's revelation. I, I hope Mrs. Macca uh, has been supporting you, mate, and uh, glad to see you're on deck. Uh, and I've got the best missus in the world. She really looks after me. Oh, wow. That's getting good Seen, that was a, can I just say that that was a fabulous bit of timing because I'd actually uh, disconnected myself and I was madly <laughs> scrambling to get myself back online and just... <laughs> And just <laughs> as it came on, uh, you, you said the words, Peter. And so I was able to just say, like nothing had happened, I was able to say, yeah, good, mate. Yeah, here you go. You know we run a professional so, organisation. We very much do. We very much do. <laughs> All right. Well, there's stacks to talk about, so uh, why don't we hook straight into it with a bit of news, eh? <laughs> well... Where do we even start? I mean, I, I think let's let's look let's uh, let's start on a positive. Um, great to um, see the club champion award um, through the week, and and um, certainly a very very deserved winner in uh, Rory Laird. I had a fabulous season. Uh, he was he was absolutely terrific. Um, I should also just mention I thought that uh, that Josh Jenkins coming up into third was a, a really well deserved. Finish for him, uh, much maligned, and um, had a, had a really good season. But I, I couldn't help thinking, um, Fane, that in a premiership year that wouldn't have been the same top ten as uh, as what we had. There'd be a few changes, I reckon. Yeah, I reckon you're probably right. I mean, uh, it, the BNF was probably indicative of uh, the season that we had and the people that stood up and the people that couldn't get on the park. So. Unfortunate, but I do agree with you uh, on Jenkins. I, I thought he was actually a bit stiff to miss out on uh, all Australian squad selection. To be honest with you, um, mm. and uh, I, you know, as we've mentioned throughout the the year, and certainly in the latter part of the year, he's really stepped up and and uh, addressed parts of his game that we were critical of. Um, so just reward for him, and also, of course, uh, probably a bit stiff. Tom did a. Eh? Bit stiff, I reckon, um, but inevitable. On the rising star, yeah, yeah. I thought he was. I thought he was stiff. I thought he had a. Um, I mean, we all know he had a, a fantastic season. Um, just difficult. To, they were, you know, uh, Stevenson was certainly a worthy winner, and um, just a, a, a difficult year to uh, to crack the award. Unfortunately, when he had so much competition with it and took a, quite a few votes as well, and he had a, a terrific year as well. So those three players were, you know, really outstanding. Yeah, couldn't argue with it all there, Pete. And, uh, you know, I think uh, any, any of them would have been... <laughs> and uh, you got me a bit confused now. <laughs> uh, what I was going to say, no, any one of those three were worthy winners. And uh, in, I think in any other year, um, our bloke would have won it um, because it's very difficult to come in and replace a lever who was, in the end, was traded for two first-round draft picks and take his role on and do better than the guy that he replaced. Yeah. Uh, before he did make the uh, the twenty two under twenty two, which was a really good achievement for him, and um, probably I think Stiffy he, he was fifth in the BNF. I think right till about the last game, wasn't he, or second last game or something or other. And yeah, something I think like it was Greenwood just took him over. It was very, and it was only a one vote the difference. So, you know, he was probably um, stiff to be um, pushed out there. So no, fantastic season. That's all the good stuff. What else? <laughs> <laughs> well, at risk of uh, turning the whole episode into a Collective Minds episode, um, we can't ignore the fact that there was uh, obviously quite a lot of news um, floating around um, in relation to that. And um, the biggest bomb of all, of course, was probably Friday night, uh, Friday afternoon's release of the article from Caroline Wilson, which uh, sent the airwaves into meltdown and... Um, a whole lot of allegations there and a whole lot of um, um, issues that uh, remain unanswered um, and certainly um, as uh, is fairly predictable, the club didn't engage um, and um, didn't really uh, come out <clears throat> and clarify uh, to my knowledge. It, someone, might have, someone else might have picked that something up, but I certainly didn't hear anything across the weekend that um, 
uh, refuted any of that stuff. So it, um, I mean, where do you even start with that really? Well, you raise a very, an excellent point there, Pete, because of when people make allegations against you, whether they're true or not, if you don't answer them, people assume they're true. And uh, that's where Burton, in his brilliant style, messed the whole bloody thing up, dickhead. That, I'll just say it again there because he is one. <laughs> um, and he made a nice mess of that the press conference, as we all know. He, he could have actually, if he'd done a decent job then, virtually put the whole thing uh, virtually to bed. Um, he, of course, he avoided the whole thing and made mockery uh, of the reporters as well, and uh, of course, everybody offside. Um, but um, you're talking about Friday night. I think it was either Thursday or Friday. Mark Williams also made the statement about players being tied naked to trees, and nobody's come out and refuted that as well. And it's probably bullshit. But the whole point is, until somebody refutes it, it's assumed to be true. Donkey, what do you reckon? You're Mr. Optimist. Sorry, I just had an attack of little donkeys. But um, uh, I, uh, I tend to think that um, where there's smoke, there's fire a bit on this. And um, the fact that we haven't really come out and rebuffed a lot of the stuff, the fact that it's still bleeding on, the fact that Mitch McGovern actually walked mm. away, um, you know, the fact that Curly Hampton's season was a bit weird and then he... Um, then he got dizzy and couldn't play anymore. Um, I just think there's just a little too much going on for it to be a uh, um, nothing to see here type of moment. Uh, I do think that it was a massive dog's act to drop it, you know, at five hours before a club's BNF. Um, and I think that um, I think that we've clearly upset the media to a point where they are just trying to tear absolutely every shred off us as possible. Um, so I think. I think we're somewhere in between um, a complete catastrophe and um, and being able to put together a, a decent 2019. I saw a pikey speech and I was actually pretty, I thought it was pretty good. Um, and uh, uh, so I don't think we're, I don't think it's game over and everything's bad, but I just think the club has mismanaged this situation and the injuries to a point where it's just a, it, it's a complete farce. Um, I back the 22 blokes on the field every week, but um, but the guys backing them up are, are, are atrocious. Yeah, I, I'm probably uh, of a like mind, Donkey, I think. I, there's a couple of things that really stick out for me. Uh, all season, um, we were told and, and uh, others in the media were told that the Crows had done their due diligence on, um, on the camp and on collective minds. Um, and then we had uh, uh, Wayne Carey come out on... Monday night on uh, Talking Footy and hence the the name of the cast tonight um, and it was pretty obvious that he was a, he was acting as an unofficial spokesperson on behalf of uh, you know maybe Mark Rusciuto, uh or maybe Brett Burton or a combination of the two um, but uh, you know he's come out and said well you know Burton didn't know anything about it and Fagan didn't know anything about it and the club themselves have tried to spread the responsibility over the last week or so. Now, on the one hand, all season you've had the club say, well, we did our due diligence and it got signed off at all levels and it went through our integrity unit and all the rest of it. And then lately they've been saying, well, some key people didn't actually know much detail about it. Now, which is it? You know, you can't have it both ways. Um, and to me... Uh, the rhetoric over the over the last week or so, and certainly capped off by Wayne Carey's uh, comments last night, seem to indicate that the club are trying to uh, uh, control the damage, protect a couple of key personnel, um, and time will tell, I guess, as to whether that's successful or not. Because I don't know whether the media are actually going to lie down over over Brett Burton's involvement in this, and, and to a lesser degree, Andrew Fagan. Well, it raises a good point, Fina. Um, what I what I genuinely can't understand is that what did they think that Caroline Wilson was was going to do back in whenever it was she first released her article on this, which I think it was you know probably back in March or April, and they um, and she had a source at that point, um, and they've stonewalled her, and instead of trying to get ahead of the message and perhaps work with her and trying to limit the damage in a sensible way, they have gone to ground, they have duck-shoved 
and they've done a whole lot of uh, about faces and um, uh, you know that that ridiculous um, press conference, that bizarre and ridiculous mm. press conference with Pike and Burton in the middle of the year, um, and you know clearly you know someone of her um, her standing in the AFL you know in the, in the, in the press wasn't just going to go away. You know, she wasn't going to just cop that, and, and all that's happened now is that she's she's dug further, and the place is obviously leaking like a sieve, because um, you know th- that article that she released on Friday was quite obviously well sourced, um, and um, you know the place is leaking like a sieve. She's just gone, she's gone, you know, harder and harder and harder, and instead of trying to actually you know get ahead of the message and manage it, they've just um, you know they've kept their head in the sand and and. Um, uh, and and supporters are none the wiser of you know really of what um, what happened other than the fact that you know we we know that they cancelled the contract um, we know that there's been apologies now, you know of, of late particularly Don Pike at the BNF um, <clears throat> there's been acknowledgement and so we know that something's gone wrong we know that something was bad at, at that at that particular camp. Um, but there is this sort of oblique, you know, reference of, you know, we, we, we might have pushed it a bit too far and, and you know, they want to, you know, they don't want to release any details. And and so it's just been a, a schmozzle. And I think that, and I said this, I said this way back in June, Fane, when we first, when we did that that, that big couple of episodes and I, f- I felt all the way along that part of the problem, part of the disconnect is that the club has refused to publicly acknowledge um, the, the, the players um, concern over this and that is where the disconnect is that the players have wanted some acknowledgement of how they fe- how they were feeling about it uh, and how it affected them and I thought that the um, the conference uh, the press conference mid-year was a really really poor attempt to try and um, give them that acknowledgement and hope that they um, because if you remember that was just after we'd had the, that appalling three or four weeks yeah, yeah. Um, and just after that, then they, because, you know, we went six and three at the start, six and three at the finish, and then, and we blew four in the middle, mm. um, and, and they were horrible performances, <clears throat> excuse me. And, and there's clearly disconnect between the players and the, um, and the club. And a lot of that is to do with the fact, in my opinion, um, I don't know this for a fact, but my opinion is a lot of it is to do with the fact they have not been prepared to acknowledge the damage that that camp did to certain players. Well, do you think, um, that lack of acknowledgement uh, might be a product of perhaps some uh, friction or disconnect, not only but uh, from uh, the footy department admin and exec towards the players, but also within that department itself. Oh, absolutely, and I'm sure it's a, I'm sure it's a source of disconnect between certain certain factions of the playing group as well, because oh. it's all. I mean, it's always been the case that certain players were happy with the camp. Oh, you, it, it you, just, sorry, go on, Mac. I was just going to say, you referring to, say, like Pikey not agreeing with uh, what, what's been done and said because he certainly didn't agree with what Burton was saying at, the, at that alleged uh, explanation to everybody. Well, you know, we had uh, Rob Chapman come out on Club Championship Night and basically not want to talk about it anymore. Um, and made some fairly broad brush statements regarding mistakes and and then proceeded to you know say that by and large we had the right people in the right spots and all the rest of it um but was very short uh, and very succinct in saying that he didn't want to address anything anymore and that it was time to move on and yet then we had don pike uh in his speech make what i thought was a pretty genuine uh effort to acknowledge uh, mistakes um yep. and to acknowledge Agreed. um uh, that they'd got things wrong, uh, and to me, to me, I think they're. Uh, I mean, we hinted at the disharmony that seemed apparent between Burton and Pike um, during the mid-season break when they had that uh, silly press conference. But to me, it, it smacks of an ongoing disconnect between certain sections of the footy department, and I think that you know, from what I've heard uh, from a couple of people, um, you know, th- there's a solid chance that. There are parts of the club that are very concerned about uh, the the corporate side, the revenue streams, the you know the building the club, and that's and that's fine. That's you know partly what they're employed for, but I don't think that they're necessarily in tune with those people that are primarily concerned with winning premierships, 
I think at the moment the club might be suffering a little bit of an identity crisis or certainly uh, a directional crisis in terms of what it really stands for um, and what they're all try- there to try and achieve. Well, you've got the other problem too, is that I, don't, I think that uh, in any other football club that didn't have um, somebody as uh, powerful as Ricciuto in it, that the, the Brett Burton would be sacked. I have no doubt that in a properly run football club where their people aren't being uh, sponsored, if you like, into their position by being a mate, uh, then the Brett Burton would go. But the problem and one of the reasons why Brett Burton won't go is because he's Rashido's mate. And, that, and that's just not a good enough reason to have a person in that position when they've already caused a lot of, prob- of the problems and then, ex- and then exacerbated the whole thing when they had a press conference when they explained nothing. Well, do you think it might be even more correct to say, Macca, that uh, had Rashido not been on the board, then we wouldn't be talking about this because Brett Burton wouldn't have been employed in the first place? Well, that's 100% what I am saying. You know. So, you know, we thought it was going to be a, a massive asset to have Rue there, but I, um, if this is an example of what the club's going to experience because of Rashido being there... I'd rather he just F off and get out of it. Yeah, I mean, he was he, he certainly <laughs> stepped in at a time and he, and he appeared to be uh, the kind of bloke that just wanted the footy club to be successful. Uh, but I've said for a long time that I, I feel that the, the culture is very, very strong at the Adelaide Footy Club. And I, I've seen changes in, in Rashudo's demeanour. I've seen changes in Andrew Fagan's demeanour with regards to... Um, you know their direction and their and their purpose and and, and just the way that they speak, uh, what they what they find important and what they're passionate about. Uh, Andrew's very passionate about building the membership base and expanding the uh, the base of the club, and that's fine. That's part of his role. But as I said, I, I don't know whether perhaps there is enough uh, credence paid to those such as the coaching staff or the strength and conditioning staff when it comes to actually. Uh, doing what Andrew initially said he was going to do, which was to build the best football department in Australian football. Uh, I think Andrew's moved away from that. Um, And I think that's where the disconnect currently might sit within the club. I thought, um, um, Don, what you were saying before about some of the indicators coming out of the club with, you know, people, players leaving. And I thought one of the really big... um, Stories from through the week was uh, was the Josh the Josh Franco situation, which seemed really really curious to me. That you know he comes in and he transfers from you know such a professional club like Sydney, and and um, he is uh, uh, signed a con- signed a contract for three years, returning home to Adelaide. Then after one year with the football club, he uh, he's gone, and um, it was certainly mentioned in Wilson's article on, on Friday that. Um, uh, he he um, was concerned and had written to the club about his concern uh, re- relating regarding the camp. And I think these are all the, as you say, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. And these are all the sort of the little things, little blocks that are building up to uh, to make a fairly strong case that she's, um, you know, her sources are on uh, are from within the four walls. And um, the other thing, of course, was the medical report. Um, which you know nobody had heard about at this stage. The fact that there was a medical report done, and and that was given to Burton, and and but wasn't handed on. He um, sat on it. He sat on it for for quite some time. So you know, there's all these you know quite sort of specific and um, um, you know information that only comes from within the four walls. But there's all these things that are building up, which says you know that as you as you point out that um, that we, you know where the smoke there's fire. Yeah, and that's uh, it's really easy, and I've seen a fair bit happening on the um, big footy board. It's fairly easy to write off, you know, every attack from the media as being some form of grand Victorian conspiracy against us. And you know, and, and I do think at times like this, they are probably sinking the boot in. But but Caro is a investigative investigative journalist um, from a long time, even before she re- reported on footy, and um, to dismiss you know, dismiss it as hyperbole and, 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 and rumour, I think is, uh, I think it's a very mi- big misstep by a lot of people. And I think people need to have a think about, you know, what is actually happening and what are the, what are we seeing through the results? Like, and what are we seeing through the, um, in the, the player movements, as we said, um, 
it, something happened in the middle of the year that was bigger than injuries. You know, I watched I watched the side basically walk around their opposition on uh, Traeger Park in, in the middle of the, in the middle of the year. You know, we lost to Fremantle that didn't have a Nat Fife and uh, a Sandlands um, with a fairly decent squad on the park. You know, there was something happened in the middle of the year um, that that made us have a reset and a change and, and to the groups, uh, you know, the playing groups credit, they did have a reset and they found their mojo again, but there was, there was four or five weeks in the middle there where, where this club, you know, hit rock bottom in terms of playing performance. And I think something, something around that time is, is where we're looking at. So, which means it's not just the camp, it's the follow up to the camp. And, and I, yeah, that's where I think the rotten part is. Well, the example that Pete gave about Franco, for example, um, you know, the, the opportunity to coach at home, et cetera, et cetera, and yet and they have a three-year contract, yet he's prepared to walk away, um, if necessary, from football altogether, um, just not to be at Adelaide. And I think that is that that is very, very telling, in my opinion. Yeah, and he was a bloke from a really good cap. You know, premiership player at Port, you know, pretty respected midfield coach at Sydney, you know, gets to Adelaide, you know, after, you know, less than 12 months in the job, wants out and nothing to do with footy anymore. Like that's, that's, that's an indictment of the club. Yeah, it's savage. Um, and I'm the optimist. Yeah, you are the optimist, mate. And, <laughs> you know, you're, you're right. There's been a lot of people that have just, oh, you know, move on, you know, trust the club, blah, 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 blah. We'd all love to, but uh, I mean, the facts are the facts, and and the number one fact in all of this is that we were a grand finalist uh, that has sunk to twelfth on the ladder the following year, um, and with some, you know, highlights such as the Traeger Park game and the Hawthorne game, which was yeah. in in many respects a Hawthorne game was more horrifying for me than the Melbourne game because the Hawthorne game was essentially played in one half of the ground all night. Um, we had no answers and no one appeared to make or want to make an effort to uh, to do anything. Um, look, I think, notwithstanding all the camp talk, I think uh, the impact of the injury management uh, has been underplayed. Um, and I think uh, the camp uh, certainly presents very good tabloid fodder for the, for the media. Um, and the issues around our injuries are probably less sensational. But I think it's worth highlighting the fact that, um, you know, uh, uh, as we've stated before, we, we implemented uh, new technology poorly. Um, and as a consequence, we've now made what I, what I think is a, a very, very key appointment for a couple of reasons. Steve Saunders coming on board. Steve obviously is the, um, one, one of the main designers of the Kanga Tech um, technology. Um, designed when he was at North, uh, Kangatech's owned by a couple of North directors, Carl Delena, and I always forget the other guy's name. Steve was essentially responsible over the last 12 to 24 months in promoting that product uh, globally, and it, and it has got traction globally. Um, now, to, to get Steve on board, um, together with the fact that uh, we know that they're developing uh, a new interface uh, in order to utilise the software or utilise the technology a little bit better. It says to me a couple of things. First of all, they've uh, they've acknowledged that they have to spend more money within the football department, and yes, they've let some people go in order to do that. But I think it's a redirection of funds. Um, so they've certainly looked at it from a financial perspective. But secondly, I think uh, bringing Steve on board is also going to have a positive impact on those players that have struggled to stay on the park because you've got the bloke who made the stuff now at the club. He's also a, a well-respected uh, um, proponent of injury management. Um, he's got a fantastic track record um, at North Melbourne, uh, Sean Higgins being the poster boy of, of that program. Um, and I think you know, we've heard some unrest uh, rumours, you know, surrounding a few blokes like Bradley Crouch and a couple of others, um, you know, and largely because of injury mismanagement. You know, there's, there's talk that part of Mitch's uh, reasons for wanting to go is uh, poor poor injury management uh, around grand final time last season, around the finals last season, when he was played in round 23 with a, with a tight hammy when he should have been rested. 
there's talk about um, a player at the club may be in dispute because certain contract triggers weren't uh, triggered uh, because of injury. So I think bringing Saunders on, uh, as much as it's got some practical you know, ramifications, uh, hopefully positive, I think it's also the club saying to the players, look, all right, we, re- we acknowledge it and here's what we're doing to fix it. We're actually bringing in the bloke that built the stuff. So I, I think of all the appointments that occur or changes in our personnel that occur during the off-season, I think Steve Saunders is the key. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, mate. And, uh, yeah, and well hopefully, said, well the, said. hopefully the interface has a, you know, has an iPad <clears> that just flashes red and says, Brett, stop putting him on the, um, put him on the treadmill. The other uh, bit of news around um, in terms of appointments is that um, uh, the, a bit of uh, bit of talk around that Marty Matner may have um, may consider that uh, the move to Adelaide is the way to go for him, and um, of course he's involved in Sandville finals at the moment. But he, uh, I imagine, would be um, a good uh, pickup, having been outside of the the Crows environment for a good number of years, played in the successful system at Sydney, and of course has been a, an outstanding coach for the Sturt Football Club. So I think that would be, uh, if that uh, comes to fruition, that would also be uh, a pretty good appointment for 2019. I think yeah. it's, I think it's very likely. Uh, I did hear him interviewed and uh, he was asked about this, but the way he didn't want to talk about it made it clear to me that there is something in, in this art and conversations going on. Uh, you just you, Usually, with, if there's nothing in it, they make some comment. No, there's nothing there, or something like that. But the way he was talking, I think there's definitely something there. And uh, and I think uh, what you said about him, Pete's hundred percent right. He's been in a good environment uh, when he was with Sydney. Uh, he's proven that he can coach when he's been with Sturt, and, and yeah, he'd he'd be a very uh, solid addition to the to our coaching staff, I think. So you're a Sturt man. What what does he bring? Well, I'm actually really disappointed in the Adelaide Footy Club for derailing Sturt's Premiership uh, campaign, or attempting to. Um, you know, uh, obviously, haven't got their priorities right. But yeah. <laughs> no, look, I mean, the word the word about Marty is that he's just a really good communicator and he's a very good thinker when it comes to uh, tactics. He he's got Sturt playing um, a, a very repeatable style of football, um, and it holds up under pressure. Um, it didn't hold up under three umpires getting behind them, getting behind the Eagles last week. But anyway, um, but you know, I, I think Mackie, you're right. What you say, he's got good pedigree. Um, he's got runs on the board, and uh, I, you know, I mean, we have brought in Franco unsuccessfully this season from another system. Hopefully, hopefully, um, they bring Martin Matner on with a with a sense of actually using what they're employing him for which is, I think, probably something that they perhaps didn't do with Josh Franco. If you're going to employ someone, you're employing them because of their strengths. You might as well use their strengths rather than just slot them in and, and get them to toe the line. Um, so I hope they've learnt in that regard. And the other thing, you have to be, uh, to be a successful coach. You have to be a very good man manager, and uh, uh, that is apparently uh, one of his real strengths, which you touched on there, Phoenix, yep. uh, is man management. Um, a good mix of, of uh, being, you know, not one of the lads, but certainly being able to talk on their level, but also commands enough respect um, that, that, that they play for him. So, you know, it's a different kettle of fish being a line coach in an AFL team, but I hope the Crows recognise the strengths that they're employing him for if they do bring him on and actually utilise those strengths rather than just, you know, stick him in a in a slot and say, there you go, do your bit. Um you know, obviously, uh, Pete, there was... Who was the other bloke that was uh, roaming around that's off the... Mar- oh, there's been no more word on Sumich, has there, with regards to another slot? No, just that um, uh, his name's sort of often mentioned in connection with Don Pike, but uh, nothing nothing as strong as what's been put out about Matt now. Yeah. Yeah, that seems to be a done deal. Uh, and then... A couple of whispers about players too. It looks like Lysett might be going to uh, Port Adelaide after a bit of interest from St Kilda. Um, and Polek also in a bit of tug of war between the Kangaroos and the Saints as well seems to be the latest rumours. Yeah, and a little bit of uh, chatter about uh, Chad Wingard as well, although I suspect that that is the, um, 
that will go down the Hamish Hartlett path of yeah of uh, just wanting to give him a kick up the backside and um, uh, or you know some tension on his part with the uh, the Port Club and there'll be some ridiculous demand about um, his uh, his trade value and he he won't go anywhere and so that will just play out as a little bit of a spat between the two as um, Hartlett's did I suspect. Um, well, isn't he asking for a million dollars a year over five years? Yeah. Like, tell him that's going to be nowhere. Jousting and sticks. Tell him strength. <laughs> yeah. Well, the we heard Fiend was. Sorry, go. On. I was just going to finish that one off by saying it's interesting that Chad's manager would come out with that number when Port have already said that they can't match for pole league. So I don't know what they think um, they're doing unless they think that perhaps uh, there might be a little bit more money in the kitty with with Pollock going. And uh, they want their share of it, but uh, doesn't Chad get free agency uh, next year? Twenty twenty, I think. The end of next mm. year. Yeah, well, I don't think Port will shift on that, and I don't think anyone will pay a million a year for him either. No, I think his manager uh, just floated it out there to see what what might float back in the, the direction towards Chad, and I, I don't know if he would really expect to get a million, but he might. He seen to he can fish out eight hundred or nine hundred or something like that. Um, I mean, you wouldn't you wouldn't say it just for no reason at all. No, you wouldn't think. Sorry, Pete. Go on. What was, what was the next one? Well, you and I both had a bit of a tip off uh, through the week about Peter Wright um, from the Gold Coast, apparently mm. um, in the sights of the Adelaide Football Club. So that um, um, I don't know how much weight that's one that one's got. Certainly not from uh, where we got the. Uh, um, the Mitch McGovern stuff, but um, yeah, you know, you never know. Right. So that's potentially someone we're talking to. Um, but uh, as I say, we'll we'll take that one with um, without the uh, the weight that we uh, that we <laughs> give uh, the other one. So um, that's interesting. Um, Mitch McGovern. That's the big, I guess, talking point from a trade perspective uh, oh, yeah. for, for us. What's happening with him? Yeah, interesting. He was at the best and fairest on Friday night and seemed to be uh, from all reports. Uh, uh, pretty happy and was uh, no dramas with all of the players. So um, that's good. That's a good result. Um, no need for the animosity. Um, so uh, uh, I think that um, I think there's a, a strong a strong chance that we will get um, um, a, a pretty decent draft pick from him. There's some a little bit of talk around the back that Gold Coast might be ready to throw something at him as well. Yeah, that could uh, raise the stakes a little bit. So I'd imagine there'll be a few offers that will come in, and we can sit back and. And uh, work out what's the best. Cam Ellis Yeoman, Pete. Um, now there was wasn't I think Treaders dropped a an interv- uh, a rumor that he was uh, looking Sydney were looking at uh, Cam Ellis Yeoman, um, and they have looked at him before. Uh, this wouldn't be the first nibble they've had at Cam, um, and I think he'd suit their style to be honest. He certainly would because uh, at the moment they were, they they're, this season they were really down to only two. Uh, genuine midfielders. Um, Hannaberry had a very, very poor season. Uh, Kieran Jackie, he, he came good at the, the couple of games towards the end, but he was a non-entity as well. And, uh, you know, it's really just Parker and Kennedy busting their guts every week. Uh, so they knew that, so a, a midfielder would be very handy for them. Yeah, although another one, they don't have a lot of outside pace really, do they? They don't have any. So I don't know where Ellis Yeoman fits in there. I, I still, I still think that um, uh, Cam Willing, uh, there's he might end up being a bit of not steak knives. He's better than that, but you know what I mean. A bit of a sweetener in in a McGovern trade to get us up the up the uh, up the draft order a bit. Um, I think he'd uh, if he wanted to go to Gold Coast and that's where Mitch was heading. I think he'd be a good fit up there. Um, and Carlton will take anyone at the moment if that's where Mitch ends up going as well. So. I don't think it would be a bad career move for Cam actually to uh, to leave Adelaide. He's been in the system for a long time. He's had one or two ups and downs. Um, he's probably being overtaken uh, by Hugh Greenwood. Um, uh, certainly not on stats, but just on general you know vibe around the place. Um, but I think he would be a more than serviceable inside mid, uh, very workmanlike inside mid for a number of clubs. Um, and I think he could do a lot worse than to explore his options. Well, I, you know, on top of that, you know, there's the Gooch as well. Um, uh, we've got 
plenty of inside mids and we need outside mids as well. And that's where I think the Gooch might, might well play a bit of midfield next year. Yeah, I certainly hope so. He was a very, very impressive last few games for the Gooch. He was very impressive, yeah. I thought. Yep. Yeah, very finished good. off strong. Any other news before we move on and maybe talk about the finals coming out this week, even though we're not a part of it? Just quickly, I um, had a look at the TV on Sunday to see um, one Jay Lacocious have a, have a kick of the, the leather on, on Sunday. I thought he was pretty impressive. I don't know what you guys thought, but um, I thought this is the guy that's going to uh, cause all of the uh, the flurry uh, come dra- trade week and, and draft week. So uh, it was interesting to have a look at him play. I've seen him a few times and... Um, um, yeah, I thought he, um, he 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 had a quiet second half, but his first half was very impressive. What did you what did you think were his uh, strong points, uh, Pete? Oh, I think that because he he, I think that I think that, that we've all got the um, um, the idea that he's some sort of uh, big power key forward, and um, he's just not. He's a he presents to me very much as a utility type player, um, and. Um, he, his capacity, his running capacity, his vision, his um, his ability to involve himself in the play. Um, I think that he projects to me almost as a um, almost as a James Heard um, type player. I can't remember what, how tall James Heard was, and I, off the top of my head, I don't have the, the height statistics. But James Heard was a player that just put himself where he needed to be, and he could play on the ball. He could he could play a key position forward, uh, or he could he could play key back. He, he was that kind of player. And I just see Lukosius as being so much more than, um, you know, a, um, a gorilla key forward. And I, I think that there is sort of some some thought around that maybe that's what he is, but I don't think he is. I think he's going to be much more than that. Well, where, where would you see him if he, once he'd been in the system three or four years? Where would you see him playing? Well, I think he's, I think you, you'd, you'd call him a utility Maca, you call him a utility that, depending on where you know where you needed him to play. I mean, where did James Heard play? Yeah, but that's yeah. a fair comment. Different game though now. Do you know Pete. what I mean? Different, different game now. It's I mean, versatility is really important. Um, but the game is all about roles, and um, I still see Luco as a as a uh, powerful lead up forward who can get up the ground a bit. Um, mm. Uh, but you're right. You could swing him down back, no problems at all. But I, I still see him. I, I still think he's a forward. And do you, do you think he's going to be as good as they say he's going to be? You asking me? Oh, it's, really hard. it's hard. Well, it's, it's it's obviously it's hard because you know they. You just never you know, you never really quite know um, how they're going to turn out. But it, you know. Everything that you see, you would have to say that he's got a, you know, a long AFL career in front of him. Oh, well, I don't doubt that. But the point is that Adelaide you know, prepared all my silver farm to get him. The um, difference is, Macker, is that he's, you can look at him he's, and he, you know, can watch him playing amongst men. And a lot of the, um, you know, if you look at um, picks like Shaki and McCartan and those kind of guys, they were playing under 18s. Yeah. The the last bloke the last bloke to present like Lukosius, in my opinion from South Australia was Matthew Pavlich, in mm. terms of his abil- his ability to just step into the big league uh, as if he's already played a hundred games and um, I don't think uh, Jack Lukosius is is physically as developed as uh, Pav was at the same age, um, and that's that's why I think that once he fills out uh, reaches his full height. Um, I just see him as a as an aggressive, hard leading, um, dynamic forward uh, who you could who you could use a little bit like Lance Franklin and get him up the ground and you know get him involved in the play sometimes out of position, um, but ultimately he's your weapon up forward. Well, Actually, that's not a bad comparison either, Fee. Now that I I come to think of it, because you know Franklin's not a massive pack mark, you know, gorilla type forward. He's you know, that he's that really you know mobile agile forward up and down the ground so that's probably not a bad comparison in the modern game mm. and there's obviously been comparisons with revolt too and I think that's a lot to do with Jack's apparent running capacity um, look you know I mean you're right uh, what number one macker is a, is a big uh, a big call but if not him then who 
Oh, no, I'm, I'm not uh, saying it shouldn't be. I'm just uh, querying uh, people who know more about it than I do with a, how they're rating, that's all. Mm, yeah. No, we got, I mean, there's Walsh is obviously in the mix and he seems like a ready-made midfielder. Um, you got those big lads, um, the the brothers uh, that play at King Brothers, uh, yeah. The, what are they, Sandringham, I think. Um, you know, and then and then you've got a whole bunch of midfielders, really. Um, so, uh, I think just for his point of difference, I think Jack offers something that none of those other players do. Um, you know, and I, I think. I've certainly seen enough of him to think that he's... If he's not a once-in-a-generation player, then he's certainly going to be a, a very handy 200-plus game player for a club. Well, if he was anything like Pavlich, who won an All-Australian back, and won an All-Australian up forward, so um, if he could go back with the forwards and be like that, well, I'd be very, very happy. Well, I mean, Pav's the same as Luca. I mean, you know, even that performance... Uh, uh, by Henley to beat, who was it? PAC in the in the um, yep. school knockout. I mean, they just owned that. Him, him, and uh, his Henley mates just owned that game. Um, you know, he, mm. he wasn't dominant by any stretch, but um, the combination of those boys running around that they, they, they were it was a powerful uh, display just from the highlights that I saw. Um, Pavlich was much the same when he was running around for Sacred Heart. They just just give him the ball. You know, and he just yeah. he just win games for them. It was it was freakish. So, um, you know, I guess that's where I make the comparison from there. And um, I, my only query on on us going for Lacocious is on need. Um, just given that we do have some good forwards and that we are crying out for some speed. Um, mm. But if you're picking on Talon alone, you, you I don't think you go past him. Well, we do have a need for pace. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I I tend to um I tend to think uh, along your lines normally, um, uh, Phoenix. But I'm just I just feel that Lukosius might be just that talented that you just pick him. Like, do you want to be sitting there in three or four years' time going, "Oh, we went with the clever pick and got somebody else, but we could have got Luko and he's the, you know, the greatest forward since since Lost Red. Well, the good thing is we might have two or three picks in the in the first round. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, if we get one of the two right, then it's not bad. And hopefully the other one's ranking, of course, because uh, when you're talking about pace, uh, that's the one. There's some talk around that he might be tanking a few uh, a few discussions with other clubs. Of course, that can't be true because you can't tamper the draft, but uh, he might be doing a bit of a Cyril, maybe. Oh, well, he said on TV today he'd be happy to go to any, to any club. Yeah, so um, he, he may he may he may be saying something different to them, but I um, he's certainly um, covering his backside in that area. Yeah. Anyway, the interesting uh, interesting times coming up, but of course this week we've got uh, the first week of the AFL finals, and uh, let's uh, even though we're not in it, why don't we just have a bit of a chat about that, shall we? represents a bit of a uh, interesting first round of the finals. There's some very interesting games on this week. Yeah, well, the AFL has got to decide on Thursday night who they gift the game to, whether the umpires are going to rig it for Hawthorne or rig it for Richmond, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> very tough in selection meeting on Wednesday afternoon. Look, I think this could represent uh, the beginning of... Richmond's demise in their quest for back-to-back. I've said it so before, you, I think. All, all, of all the match-ups, I think this is the one they wouldn't have wanted in the first week. Yeah, and apparently the first time they've ever played Hawthorne in the finals or something. Mm. That's incredible. Yeah. I think, that win. I think the Tigers will win comfortably. I think that we're all just hanging around waiting for them to... Um, um, to get their second their second flag, and they've just been um, so dominant at the MCG. Um, I mean, I don't know they've had close games there, but generally speaking, and I know what you're saying, Vina, that the um, 
that keep hold of the um, that keep hold of the football style that Hawthorne will want to play will cut it straight against the way that Richmond want to play, which is to keep the ball um, moving at all costs. Um, so conflict of game styles there, but um, just I just can't see Richmond losing at the G. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same. I think um, common sense says that based on the season, uh, Richmond should win. But the only thing against that, of course, is based on common sense. Adelaide should have won the grand final last year. But so um, anything can happen on the day. Um, I'm picking Richmond, but it wouldn't surprise me if Hawthorne with a, the, the most astute uh, coach in the competition in Alistair Clarkson uh, did pull up a, off an upset, but uh, going on form, it's <clears throat> Richmond. Yeah, I think yeah, you touched on the, the big factor for me, Macca, and that's Alistair Clarkson. Um, Richmond certainly have the most healthy list. You look at their injury list and there's just no one of any real note on there apart from probably Kane Lambert, I guess. Um, whereas Hawthorne have got a couple coming good. Uh, James Sicily should be right. Um, uh, James Frawley, if they decide to play him down back, I don't know whether they will. Birchall's a chance. Um, but Richmond certainly ha- are going to have a full squad on deck. But uh, Clarkson, Clarkson is a wild card for mine, for Hawthorne for this entire final series. And whilst I don't think that uh, they're certainly not my tip to win... Um, I think, I think uh, his influence can get Hawthorne into the prelim- preliminary final round, in my opinion. So you obviously say they're going to win this game. Yeah, I do. I think they're going to. I think they're going to beat Richmond on Thursday night. Uh, for some reason, I just I'm not as impressed. I know that Richmond have had great results this year and they've streeted the field at, at MCG and all the rest of it. Um, but for, I don't know, I've just got this nagging feeling that uh, Hawthorne are going to do a number of them on them this week. I hope you're right. Of course, we've got the Ds and the Cats on Friday night. That's also going to be an interesting one because you've got the, the Cats uh, with a very strong midfield coming up against Melbourne, who's probably uh, also both perhaps, arguably the uh, best midfield in the comp. So... Uh, definitely a battle of the midfields and to see who can perhaps you know eke out a winning score between the two teams. I think Melbourne. I think Melbourne will win this one comfortably. Uh, I think Geelong have had a couple of training runs in the last couple of rounds, and I, I don't think that is a particularly good thing coming into the finals. And um, I think Melbourne conversely had a two or three really quite. and um, have got them. What's happening to you, Pete? You're dropping out there. So it's hard to tilt. No, Pete seems to be in and out. Yeah. Well, Pete, if you can hear us, your microphone's dropping in and out, mate. You might have you might have a loose call. Better? There. I think I'm comfortable. Yeah, probably can't stream Orange is the New Black while you're doing this, mate. <laughs> uh, Donkey, what do you reckon? Uh, look, I think this is Melbourne's game to lose. Uh, they are so far ahead of the competition, they can't lose from here. And, and I'm just hoping I've put enough of the mockers on them so they do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I think they've got a very, very good team. Uh, if they've got any weaknesses at all, it is down back. Um, they've got a very good forward line. They've got a very, very strong midfield. Uh, they've got a champion Ruckman. So um, having said all that, I think Geelong are going to win the game. Uh, and okay. I think, and I think that Danger, Dangerfield hit top form last week, just absolutely top form. I, was, I thought he played num, uh, a number unbelie- unbelievable game, and I think that he will have a very big game. And I think that uh, um, Geelong will, will, I think Nurse will get uh, Melbourne a little bit, um, and I think that I'm picking Geelong. What do you reckon, Donk? Uh, Pete, sorry. Yeah, I said Melbourne, mate. Yeah, I know, but we couldn't hear you. <laughs> oh, sorry, Melbourne, Melbourne comfortably. Yeah, yeah, uh, Melbourne for me. Uh, I think uh, they're probably more impressive across uh, more parts of the ground. I think than Geelong. And they'll get up for mine, and then on Saturday, two very interesting games. Obviously, we've got the Sydney Derby, uh, Sydney versus the Giants. Uh, the Giants limping into the finals, uh, but obviously, probably got the the class edge over Sydney. 
but Sydney have a couple of weapons and uh, Buddy Franklin running on top of the ground as well. Well, it might I reckon be. this is the hardest. This is the yeah. hardest one to pick for the weekend. I reckon it is hard. It is hard because um, common sense says um, you know uh, Sydney got the home ground advantage, etc., which is not a home ground advantage, having lost six games here this year. So um, I think that if it was paid on a bigger ground, I would have to go Sydney. But uh, I think that the the Giants will uh, win it on the smaller ground. Donk. Um, I reckon, uh, uh, yeah, I agree that it's a really tough one to call, probably the toughest. I think they're both playing sporadic footy. I think that um, Sydney have probably got it together in the last few weeks more so than GWS. So I'm um, going to tip GWS. Yeah, a bit of a question mark over Franklin uh, with his groin uh, and a couple of others. Luke Parker also carrying a bit of a groin. Uh, obviously, GWS have got their well-documented injury woes, although they're getting quite a few back or quite a few available uh, this week. Griffin, Green, Delidio, DeBoer. Um, so they might actually be a little bit uh, fitter, GWS, and I think they'll get over Sydney this week. Yeah, I think um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with the Swannies on this one. I just reckon they, um, they'll just find a way. Yeah, and the last one, of course, uh, over in Perth is West Coast versus Collingwood. Collingwood, your babies. Uh, Pete, what do you reckon? Yeah, look, I'm going to stick with them. Um, I think that they've been in the top, you know, two or three teams all year, and uh, they've been um, a really exciting team to watch. They've played a really, really good brand of football, and um, they've always traditionally travelled pretty well. For a team that doesn't travel a lot, Collingwood generally travel pretty well, and um, I, I think that they'll uh, they'll get it done over there. Maca. Yeah, hot pies. Oh, Sorry. Donkey, go on. I was going to say, yeah, hot pies. They, uh, I think that um, West Coast are just lacking too much cattle. Um, and even if Kenny back comes back, he's going to be a bit rusty. So uh, without Gaff, without uh, Nick Nat, and against uh, you know a pretty steaming opposition, I think, um, I think the pies have got the goods. Yeah, I'm going the other way. I think the home ground advantage is an advantage. And... Uh, and uh, Peter is, he is right. Uh, Collingwood are good travellers, um, but uh, I still think it's a big advantage to be home and have uh, 60,000 people screaming for you and, and supporting them and perhaps influencing the umpire with a bit of luck. Um, so uh, in a very, very close one and wouldn't be surprised if I'm wrong, but I'm um, going West Coast. Yeah, I'm going West Coast too. Um, I think Kennedy will be all right. Um when he comes back, and I think he d- just his presence is going to trouble Collingwood. Um, you know, Collingwood got a, uh, uh, I guess, a bit of a cloud hanging over the side with a terrible uh, tragedy around Travis Varco, um, you know, and, and a couple of injury queries as well. I think at the end of the day, I think uh, it'll be just a bit of a bridge too far for Collingwood, but I think I think it'll be the closest game of the weekend, actually. Um, but I think West Coast just uh, sneak over the line. So that uh, that would uh, mean, uh, certainly from my tips, if uh, Hawthorne get up, then that throws Richmond onto the other side of the uh, draw. Uh, most people think that Geelong are going to go out. Uh, Sydney... And Giants could go either way, and I mean it's quite it's apart from Richmond, uh, it's quite a wide open final series, and and if the Hawks do get up in the first week, then I think it throws a premiership race wide open. Oh, well, definitely because the Richmond would have to travel then. If West Coast win, yeah, <clears throat> that means in order to get to the grand final, Richmond would have to go to Perth, and we know that they don't travel. Yeah, exactly. It brings them back uh, the to the Guinness, pack in my... The Guinness of opinion. AFL football. <laughs> very good point, Pete. That's a very good point. And uh, um, Richmond rely on the fact of winning at the, at the, at the G. And, uh, and should they lose, uh, I'd say that's the end of them. Yeah. And uh, welcome to uh, American Crow on the on the chat. And I just want to know if uh, he reckons uh, the Browns are going to do any good this season. Uh, obviously, the Steelers are going to be up and about again. They've had a very good off-season, a very good pre-season. So uh, beware the mighty black and gold. But uh, American Crow, hopefully for you, uh, 
the Browns can have a half decent season. Uh, look, we've got no competitions this week. No, do you want me to go through round one again? Or? No, not really. <laughs> now, Maka, uh, I hope you're fired up because uh, you're coming in early tonight. Oh, yeah. I thought, oh, no, yes, I'm... I am a scrubby old man. That's what I am. And I really don't care who knows it. Well, no, very long, very light on, mate. Very light on. But uh, one sweet, one sweet that I am happy to talk about is the uh, AFL with their integrity unit uh, having a look at our camp. And the, the once they've had the once over on it, it'll either be passes being acceptable, and uh, the media will hopefully shut up. Or if it's not, wasn't up to up to uh, par, and there were things that should come out, then hopefully that'll come out as well. Um, but it, it's at the moment, we just sit there like bloody idiots allowing people to pot us. And uh, the interesting thing is that the uh, uh, this medical report, the AFL didn't know about it either when they had an initial look at it with their integri- integrity unit. But uh, So that that's just a, a sweet. Um, from the smack <laughs> point of view... Was that well, a sweet or a smack or a, a comment that was 45 minutes too late? Or what was it? Well, it, it, well I had, <laughs> I had that... I had my suite as a fact that at least that it, it was going to be investigated by impartial people rather right. than the. That was my point. Very good. You got any non Adelaide Football Club sweets or smack smacker? Non Adelaide Footy Club. Yeah, because um, I mean we we spent the whole night talking about the stupid crows. Mate, my troubles have been trouble reading the papers. Crowcast. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a little bit little. I told you I'm going to be light on. Yeah, no. It's all what good. do you What do you think of Burton? Yeah, well, he's a dick, he's a dickhead. We all know that. And um, <laughs> drink. I sh- I shouldn't I shouldn't have to tell people he is a dickhead and he shouldn't hey, be there. Hey, Macca, couldn't agree more, Macca. <laughs> Macca. Yeah. There's this other. I don't know if you know. There's this other dickhead too that keeps ringing up the radio station, and always pinching all the vouchers. Oh, yeah, he won one today. 50. He won another, another one. one today, didn't he? <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, it's all about timing, mate. And I'd just also like to point out that Macca won his Dream Team competition. And how much did you bring home, Mac? 1600 bucks. Oh, Jesus. If you don't mind. If you don't mind. Yeah, uh, so yeah, so well, that's $250 for the, uh I'm actually, I might just explain to the audience why I did get that voucher. Oh, uh, it was that. That, they, they said to be a little bit bold uh, with what you would do if you were the, the list manager in terms of... Uh, players that you would either delist or trade or whatever, mainly trade. And, uh, well, obviously, um, we, you know, we've got, uh, uh, what's his name, that wanted to nick off to it on us, and we were going to trade him trade him out uh, to Carlton or to Gold Coast, whoever, we can get the best deal in. But on top of that, uh, I would trade Hardigan. I think he's certainly... <laughs> what? What, Macca? No one heard anything. <laughs> no, he's, he's surplus to, re, uh, to requirements. We've got Keith there. Uh, we've got we've got, got a lot of guys in the back line to do a lot better than Hardigan when they're playing. And uh, um, also, um, I think I would also uh, put young Kelly up for trade. Um, and because I, I think in terms of skills, I think what's he's this got to do? What's this got to do with anything? I'm telling you why I won the voucher, mate. That's what I'm telling. <laughs> And I also, and I was I was just a, a, Mac, I was just having a shit too. I didn't need a whole bloody yeah. diatribe on Look, how you won the bloody If people thing. were interested I, in what Macca had to say on 5AA, they've probably got their podcast up on 5AA.com.au now. Just go and listen to the bloody podcast and you'll and, hear someone I'd one, bloke talking about traits. The last one was CEY. No, I told you, I'm, I'm lying on because I haven't been reading the papers, mate. No, and how good. good was your report card in year five, Macca? Tell us. Um, well, I was top of the class, mate. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's tidy this up. Uh, obviously, it's a shorter Tuesday night live tonight because we <laughs> we don't have any more crows games to talk about, and we don't have any more competitions to talk about. Well, you, well, well I can talk about the other vouchers I won, mate. Well, no, nah, yeah. get stuffed. Did you get two? We do have one more competition that I I inconveniently forgot about that <laughs> that I threw up. The ladder predictor competition that I chucked in. Uh, so I haven't forgotten about it. 
uh, and I'll uh, I'll find those screenshots that I took, <laughs> and uh, we'll uh, we'll sort that out next week. Um, just before we go, uh, for those that uh, might have ventured onto our website, you'll notice that there's uh, been some upgrades. There's going to be some continued upgrades. Uh, over the off season on our website uh, probably the biggest upgrade at the moment is uh, you can now uh, sign up signing up will allow you to write your own articles so if you want to uh, uh, ramble on and, and put your point of view across there's a, a fan article section there so it doesn't cost anything to join the website or anything like that we're not going to use your information give it to Fagan so that he's got more on his database um, it's purely a way for us to uh, give you guys an opportunity to put some words down and get it out. Um, and obviously we've got our Patreon site up and running now and thanks to uh, a couple of people who have already joined um, the Patreon site. Uh, thank you very much and also thank you to those who have donated through our PayPal, PayPal uh, donation button over the course of the season. Um, we'll talk more about what's going to happen in 2019 as we go along in the next couple of casts. But if you do want to check out some of the offerings for next season, go to our Patreon account, patreon.com forward slash AFL Crowcast. And if you have a look at the different tiers there, it'll give you an idea of what's in store, including, Pete, including two game day calls next season. I've put it, I've put, much I've just put it on that, there. Mate, that's going to be... That's going to be a very, very exciting addition to the uh, to the cast, and I'm very much looking forward to that. Yeah, uh, Ryan HG style uh, is the go. I think we're all we're going to sink a few pints and play a bit of pool and have the footy on and uh, just ramble on for a couple of games and just see how it goes. So uh, yeah, so head on over to our Patreon account, check out our aflcrowcast.com website. Uh, we chuck articles up there and all different types of things. Of course, you can catch our podcast there in video or audio format on demand as you can on just about every um podcasting software known to man sorry to those that uh, had to endure a bit of a delay on our itunes uh, feed last week i don't know what went on there but uh, we got all that fixed up i'm loving sorry mate i'm just loving some of the comments coming about uh, what our commentary is going to be like i don't <laughs> following that on Spreaker, it's bloody, it, it is going to be funny it's going to be funny Oh, uh, look, I, I, look uh, we're going to have to mark it explicit. We're going to have to pick a couple of games that might go 50-50. I really do think, Pete, that we need to pick the Hawthorne game just so that we can just go crazy at the umpires. Um, but and, it, and, uh, and Jack Gunston. And Jack Gunston, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't know how it's going to go, but it's going to be fun anyway. And if you don't try, you don't know. It could be a hit. <laughs> Anyway, look, thanks to everyone on uh, who's joined us on the Spreaker Chat again tonight. It's been a slow night, obviously, uh, crows-wise, but uh, I hope you've been entertained. Thanks for those who have joined us on Facebook. And uh, obviously no rap show for the rest of the season, but we will join you again on Tuesday night next week for another edition of Tuesday Night Live. Thanks very much, guys. Cheers, boys. Yep. Good night, all.